is here tonight. Looks like that whole side over there is going to hold down that side. That's good. We're glad to have you guys here tonight. Thank you for coming. And as we prepare ourselves now to go into our next phase, which would be um, Brother Elder Marcus Mason. He is the son of the late Moses Mason. We had Brother Mason here, his father here last year. And so this is his first time here with us since his father has passed. And we are just really, really grateful to have him here. And we are so excited to see what the Lord has for us tonight. And so at this time, without further ado, we will go ahead and um, ask Brother Marcus to come up, please. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Well... It's good to be here. Amen. It uh, was a little getting used to the weather when we got here. <laughs> uh, I was uh, sharing with a few people, my son, he's 10 years old, his name is Lucas. He's turned into the weather guy. Oh. And so when he found out we were coming to Arizona, he started tracking the weather immediately. And every day he said, Dad, wow, it's going to be 100. 
hundred and something. <laughs> you gonna wear a suit? I said, yeah. We'll be inside. Said, yeah, it's gonna be a hundred. He said, man, it's gonna be hot. And so when we got here last night, and got off, got ready to get off the plane, you know, the pilot's telling you about the weather. He said, it's cooled down to 98 degrees. We all want to hit each other. <laughs> That's the high at home. We got here really late. I said, well, it won't get any cooler. This is it. But uh, it's good to be here. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. I want to make sure you know that. Um, it has been an interesting ride, a journey, since my father passed. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit. I know the story is out there, and I, I won't rehash all of those details, but it was one of just a few times in life where God speaks to you so loudly and clear that you know what you heard, you know who it was who said it to you, and it was so clear, distinct, and forceful that you know that you have to do what you were told. And that's how I'm here. Um, I've always wanted to do what God said do, even when I was younger and was trying to do my own thing. But in the hospital, the one thing that God told me when we were, as we were, hoping for a miracle, I was sitting in this room and everybody had left me in there by myself and I'm praying and I'm agonizing with the Lord. And the Lord says, Marcus, the legacy has already been set and the road map is in front of me. All you have to do is go. Now go. Amen. Now, I was in the hospital room, head in my hands, just kind of, I can't believe we're here. And that came so clear as if somebody was standing right in front of me and was talking that loud and clear. And I looked up and I looked around and I knew immediately what that was. And so I went out and I told my wife, what the Lord had just told me. But now at this moment, we're still hoping and praying for a miracle. So then when we got the news that he had passed, I knew then at that moment, the Lord had already told me, this is what I need you to do. And the impression was that strong where I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how it was going to unfold. I didn't know how I was going to step up to the plate. I didn't know how I was going to be up here. I didn't know how I was going to run the ministry. I didn't know how any of that was going to happen. All I knew was God said, this is what you're supposed to do. Now I need you to go forward. And so that is a quick summary of how I ended up, how I ended up here up front. I thank God for his blessings, uh, for all the things he has done to solidify the family. It was almost instantly, it felt like instant, we were all pressed into ministry. Uh, I didn't even feel like it was just me. I felt like it was my wife and my children, and I told them all the same thing. Uh, she, she has a job, we live in Birmingham, but I knew God said it's time for you to get out of Birmingham and get to the country. Now, don't waste any time. And so things, you know, it was a lot of fear. What are we going to do? And all I could answer was, this is what God told me to do. That's all I can tell you. And all I plan on doing is going forward. I have no idea how this is going to work. But I'll tell you one thing. God has a way of getting your attention. Amen. He has a way of solidifying to you that he's going to take care of it. And he did that in a number of ways. Um, I remember coming home, we were all coming back to my mom's house and we pull up on the land and we sell us all these things that dad has built and done with God's help. And I feel about that big. And Lord, you want me to take care of all of this. How in the world am I going to do that? And then God began to bring to mind the story of Moses in the Bible when he died and what he did for Joshua. And God began to tell me that story. He sent other people to tell me that story. And while I was hanging on, going, okay, I, I believe you, Lord. 
But this is so big. We walked into a church one Sabbath uh, morning. But I, instead of where we were from, instead of sending thank you letters for all of the condolences, I said, but when I see people, I'll just tell them thank you. And so we walked in this church, and the pastor says, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but I need y'all to pray for me. Instantly, I knew, wait a minute, something's, something's going on. Mm. He says, the Lord wants me to change my sermon. I don't know why, but he wants me to preach on Moses and Joshua. <laughs> Out of nowhere. I mean, we walked in. This is not in the church we, we were going to. And we walked in, and he says, I've got to change my sermon. <laughs> and he preached on Joshua 1. That was the final sermon on what I needed to hear that got my attention clearly. It's like, it's like everything he said, he was saying it to me. It was almost like he was standing right in my face and he was screaming, Moses, my servant, is dead. But if you do these things, you will have great success. But he was so fervent. You ever seen somebody preaching? It's not how they normally preach. He was going for it. He was fully just... And I'm sitting there going, okay, Lord, I won't ask you another question. I won't say another thing. I will not express another ounce of doubt. I won't do anything but go forward, period. And so, brothers and sisters, God has been good in solidifying the family. We're, we're moving to the country. God is working things out. And uh, I've done a lot of things around the local area. This is the first trip we've taken. And so I'm very thankful to be here um, and to see so many faces. Some I know, some I don't know, but I, I guess I'll be sitting there for a while. And after a while, I feel like I know lots more people. Uh, so we're just thankful for that. As we get started this evening, let's have a word of prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so very thankful for your holy Sabbath day. Lord, for protecting us and keeping us safe and allowing us to be here. But now, Father, we are at the moment where we need to hear from you. Lord, as I always pray, please hide me behind the cross and you speak to your people those things you want them to hear. And then, Lord, whatever it is that we hear, give our, our minds the ability to hear and understand and apply it to us. We pray for the aid of the Holy Spirit this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, brothers and sisters, I got a question for you as we get started this evening. If I was to ask you, why do you serve God, what would you say? What is your reason for serving God? Love, okay? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. It's always good. Forgiveness. Thankfulness. All of that is all of that is great. All that is good and true. But I've always been wondering, Lord, what is that that one reason why we serve or we should? And I was reading in the Great Controversy. And the Lord showed me something, and I'm going to share that with you as we get started this evening. It's in Great Controversy, page 436. It says, the duty to worship God is based upon the fact that He is the Creator. Amen. That is the reason. Now, we're thankful. He is faithful. We love Him. He loves us. But we worship him simply because he is the creator, period. That's it. And because he's the creator, he sustains us. He created us. He takes care of us. He's going to save us. The list goes on and on. So we worship him simply because he is the creator. Now, what does that open up to us? What is Satan trying to fight against right now? He is trying to get us to, or get the world to deny the creator and his creative power. 
Now, how does he do that? What's the one way he tries to get at his creative power? Evolution? Through us? How about the Sabbath? In the Sabbath, what is there? He tells you who he is, his authority, what he did. I am the creator. The first thing he attacks is the Sabbath. What is the great controversy going to be over? What is the test going to be about? The Sabbath. So we worship him because he's the creator. Now, let's think about Job. When Job came to, to the Lord, and the Lord said, now Satan, what are, you, what are you doing here? What do you want? He said, well, I come from walking up and down in the earth. You know, that, that planet that I, I've laid claim to because they've sinned. And immediately the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? That, or who is chew with evil? Now, what does this chew with me? Run from. Run from. Avoid. So what is the Lord telling Satan? Have you considered my servant Job who avoids you? Mm. Or the planet you claim? Yeah. Well, he only avoids me because you protect him. Oh, okay. Well, I tell you what. I am going to allow you to do whatever you want, but you cannot take his life. And let's see if he turns from me. We know the story. Job did not turn. He kept on worshiping the creator. And from this one story, we see that brothers and sisters, in the end of time, the things we're going to be talking about this weekend, that no matter what happens, if we have the relationship with Christ that Job had with Christ, we can stand strong. Job had everything taken from him. Everything. And he didn't have it taken over time. He had everything taken in one day. Now imagine if everything you held dear was taken from you in one day. All of your children and all of their belongings and all of your cattle and everything that makes you wealthy and makes you who you are is swept away. The only thing left is your spouse. Now just contemplate that. In one day, in a matter of hours, could you stand? Could I stand? And what's important about that is, brothers and sisters, at the end of time, as we talk about the signs of the times, as we talk about what's going on in God's church, as we talk about the state and condition of everything that's going on, the real question is, when the test comes to us, what will we do? It doesn't make any difference if we know all of the signs, what they mean, we can delineate them, give them. If we don't have the relationship that will cause us to stand when the test comes, then what good would it do to know all of this? So at, at, the, at, the, at the end of the story, at the end of the day, the important thing is, and yes, I believe wholeheartedly we need to talk about all of the signs, what they mean, what's going on in God's church, what's happening in the country, what's going on in the world, what it means, how close we are. But what it should drive us to do is to get on our knees and ask God for a closer walk with him. Amen. That is the most important thing. When Christ comes, I want to see him in peace. What about you? Amen. I don't want to be running for the rocks. And I don't want to be one that was standing up front telling other people about what's going on, telling other people to get ready, telling other people to do this and do that, and then myself be found running for the rocks when the creator shows up. So when I saw that we worship the Creator, I, I can't tell you how long I've wondered, Lord, I know, we, I know we're supposed to worship you. I'm not questioning that. But I just wonder, what is that one reason? And then he said, because I'm the Creator. There's nobody more powerful than me. Nobody can do what I do. So you, in other words, you owe everything you have and everything you are to me. 
He said, now think about your children. Now, you brought them into this world. You took care of them. You clothed them. You fed them. As far as they're concerned, they owe everything to you. Now, I blessed you to do it, but as far as they're concerned, they owe everything to you. You took care of them, you fed them, and when they disrespect you, when they disobey, when they don't pay attention, you still love them, but you have to punish them. He said, and that's, that's simply what I'm gonna have to do if my children do not follow. If they do not surrender their hearts to me. You do understand that at the the greatest challenge for Christians on this journey is simply one thing, surrender. I worked in an IT department for many years. I had a, I had a little company um, before I started doing more. And one of the things when we're working on computers that we always want to find out, we can fix an issue or make it look like it's fixed, but we really want to get down and find the problem. Right. and fix the problem. And so when I look at salvation, I want to get down to the root issue of what it's going to take to be saved, and it's a surrendered heart. At the end of the day, if we surrender our hearts to Christ and He has full control of us, can we walk upright? Yes. 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 Can, we, can we get the victory over sin? Yes. 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 Why? He gives us the power, but it's actually Him living through you, Amen. and not us. Amen. The faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. So it's Him living through us. So whenever we take over and take control, whenever we do, we're gonna mess up every single time we do. If we're not careful, you get up in the morning without having worship and run out the house, and run off to work, or run somewhere and somebody cuts you off, or somebody says something to you, or put, you respond before you know it. That wasn't Christ. But that's this journey of surrendering and asking God and allowing Christ to have more control over who we are. That's why we have the sanctuary message. We follow Christ through the sanctuary. And we, we begin to find out and understand how we are changed, how we are redeemed, how we follow him into the most holy place where he is today and behold his face through his law and surrender. We become different people. And so then when we go and witness to the world, it's not us, it's in me, it's the God in me who's working through me. So this is the foundation of what it's going to take to be saved. The rest of the information that we are given by God is to show us how close we are. So that if we're playing games, as a parent, if your children, if you tell them, I'll use my son, because I can, I can do that. <laughs> Lucas, clean up your room. But I hear him in there jumping around, jumping off the bed, shooting hoops in his room, or whatever he's doing. And I told him to clean up his room, give him a little while. I can hear the noise, so I know he's not doing anything. So then I call his name a little louder, and then I pause and wait for him to say, yes. Son, did you hear me? Yes, okay, now I'm clear, he heard me. So now he doesn't clean his room now that I'm certain that he heard me, you know what's going to happen next. I'm not one that just keeps on repeating myself over and over. The next time I'll be standing at his door and it'll be too late to clean his room. You get the analogy? God has been calling our names. He'll call our name and wait till we say yes. And they say that, did you hear me? Did you see the sign? Did you understand what I just told you? Yes. Well, now, if I have to call your name again like this, I'll be standing at the door. The test will be here, and it'll be 
too late. Brothers and sisters, we are standing on the precipice of time. How many of us, we understand that? The precipice of time. That means that where we are, we have never been before. We are standing at the end of time as we know it. When Christ comes, he will disintegrate this earth with fire. We've never been there before. He flooded the earth and just started over. This time he's going to eradicate sin. We've never been here before. We cannot ask anybody how it was the last time. This is it. We have one chance, one opportunity to be saved. That's it. And we cannot afford to be playing games at the end of time. Now, when I was young, they told us it was the end of time. And yes, it was. I understand what that means totally. But if you look in the Bible now, that's what I tell my kids, there's nothing left at the end. We're at the end of the Bible right now. We're in the end of prophecy. The, all the sevens take you to heaven, as we say. We're in the sixth of everything. Time is counting down. That question is, am I preparing or am I playing? And it gets down to the issue of who am I? Does God have full control? I want to drive this point home. Brothers and sisters, I thought I'm a nice guy. I am a nice guy. I am very congenial. I like to hang around with people. And I get on the phone with the Verizon technician. There's something going on with my phone. Now I'm being really nice. I'm asking questions. If this person is just being so matter of fact, just eh, eh, eh. So I tried to get a little more nicer. The more nicer I got, the more. And before I knew it, I was like, wait a minute. And as I was getting ready to go off into that, you don't talk to me that way. God said, is that what you're about to do? Really? And I had to grab myself and sit down. I had my head in my hand. I was like, man, I was about to go there. And, I, and my flesh really wanted to go there still. But I mean, I, the Lord said, really, is that what you're about to do? And the Lord keeps reminding me, if this stuff keeps tripping you up, if this is all it's going to take to trip you up, you are not ready. You are not safe to save. Amen. Wow. If this is all it's going to take, if all it takes is somebody to get with you, to talk out of turn to you, talk out of the way to you, mistreat you, you are not safe to save you. Marcus, I need you to get it together. I need you to pray. I need you to think before you speak. I need you to always be in a mind of prayer. I need you to be seeking my face throughout the day. When this happens, I can tell you a long way off that the devil is coming. Watch yourself. I can disconnect that button in you that he keeps on pushing. But the only way I can do it is if we're working together. If you put me up, if you pick me up in the morning and have worship with me and then put me down, it's a bad day. Amen. So brothers and sisters, I want to drill this point home. We have to have a surrendered heart. He has to be living fully through us. The signs of the times is to show us how close we are to the reality of the second coming of the creator of the universe. And like I always say, we all are going to see him. But I want to see him in peace. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go. A timed event. Everything we do is based on time. Everything. And so everything in the Bible is based on time. That's how we can track the prophecies. That's how we can understand what's going on. Christ coming as a baby happened on time. time. How many of us know that it had to happen on time? Amen. Like It had to happen on time. It couldn't be a day before, a day after, later in the afternoon. It had to happen on time. All right. 
Let's read this. The Savior's coming was foretold when? When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. The joyfully welcome, they joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Those who first received it, what? Died. Without the sight. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing. And yet, he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away. The voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, the days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. Can you imagine that after sin came into world, after Adam and Eve sinned, and they were put out of the garden, and they were told that a way was going to be made for man to be redeemed, immediately they looked for a redeemer. So everyone that had a boy child was hoping that my son was going to be the one to redeem the world. Now that's at the very beginning of time as we know it. That went all the way down to the flood. No savior. After the flood, God repopulated the earth. Still no savior. Went all the way through time. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and no redeemer. So you can understand why they would be like, the days are prolonged. Every vision fell. Like we've been waiting on the coming of the Creator. We've been waiting on the Redeemer, and yet none. When you study the Bible and you look at time, you understand between Malachi and Matthew is 300 years where there was no mention or word from a prophet. So can you imagine that you get to Malachi and, and they didn't have it in this order at the time, you understand, it was just scrolls with things written. But you get to Malachi and nothing, there is not a prophecy and not a new prophecy at all for 300 years. And then Matthew, and then right on time, the Savior was born. Now, let me ask you something. What did God give his people before the times when he was born to let them know how or what was going to happen for them to be redeemed? Sanctuary. Said I heard 70 weeks. My wife said it, but I, I'm not going to ask her to repeat it. <laughs> God gave his people something to show them what was coming. The sanctuary service. Ah, the sanctuary service. Brothers and sisters, if we don't understand the sanctuary fully, we got to go and study it. We've got to go and study it. That is how we are going to be redeemed. You see in the outer court, what happened in the outer court? I heard some young people over there. That makes, me, that makes me feel really good. What happens in the outer court? The crucifixion. the crucifixion. Now, where did Jesus die? Outside the outer court. In the outer court. He couldn't die anywhere else but in the outer court. That's why when he died on the cross, what happened? What stopped? The service. The sacrifices. Why? Because he was the sacrifice. So he has showed them what was going to happen 1,500 years before it happened. 1,500 years. And you do know just by a fact that Satan didn't even know what was going to happen. Because Satan was not in the meetings in heaven. What we're going to find out if we get this far this, this weekend is that the plan of redemption was not put together when Adam and Eve sinned. Amen. It was from everlasting. It was already put together and waiting for the moment when it was going to happen. 
So the plan of redemption had already been put in place. It was on the shelf just waiting to be pulled off and activated. Now, now, Satan was not included in these meetings about creating earth and all of that. Why? He was a created being. Now, now I want you to imagine this. We won't stay here long. But I want you to imagine this. It's Lucifer, that's who he was at the time. And Christ were both covering chairs. But now Lucifer didn't realize he was created. He did not know. He thought he was like Christ. He just thought he'd already always been there. So when he wasn't included in the meetings, he had a problem with that. So then when he decided to raise up and, 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 and have an attitude about it, so to speak, he was reminded, uh, this is between me and my father. You are close, but you're not family. So this is between me and my father. And so unfortunately, because you are created, you can't be a part of this meeting. This meeting is for gods. So you can't be there. So we know, we know the story. He raises the rebellion. Now, he's put out of, the, he's put out of heaven, him and, and all those who follow him, and he comes down to earth. And he's here. He causes them to sin. But then when the announcement is made that redemption is coming, he, wait a minute, what, what plan? I don't know anything about that. So as he studied, as he watched uh, Patriots and Prophets, no, Story of Redemption talks about that he watched with fiendish intensity the sanctuary service. And he watched it for 1,500 years. So he was clear what was going to happen. He was clear that the Son of Man was coming. And he was clear that it was going to be his head in the end if he didn't stop the plan. So he understood what was going to happen by watching the sanctuary service. So now today, if we don't understand the sanctuary service, we're kind of flying blind. If we don't know where Christ is, what he's doing, what we should be doing, we're flying blind. And Satan has been, unfortunately, tremendously successful with squashing this message in God's church. Because he knows that if this is how I found out, finding it, they'll never know what they're supposed to be doing. They won't even know they got to get victory over sin. Yet, yet, let alone how. They won't know how to live. If I can cut this off, they, they don't have they don't stand a chance. And brothers and sisters, that is what is happening today. We need to go back. If we're not studying the sanctuary, go back. If we're studying it, study some more. Because this is what illuminates our path on how we're going to be redeemed. Jesus came on time. He died on the cross on time. When you go back and look at the, 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 the feast, he had to die on the day he had to die on. He had to die when the lamb would be slain at 3 o'clock. He had to. And so when he did, he died on time and he did what? Rose. He rose on time and he went back to heaven and he waved the first fruits on time. Then he came back, stayed for 40 days, sent them to the upper room for 10 days, and then what happened in 10 days? Now, now brothers and sisters, I'm way ahead of myself already. But let, let, me, let me just say, Pentecost was necessary to start the Christian church. Now, what did the disciples do after Pentecost? They evangelized the world. But now, why did they evangelize the world? He thought, he thought they wanted Jesus to come right then. So if we go and turn the world upside down and give them the gospel, then Jesus is going to come back right away. Can you imagine walking with the master? Day after day, watching miracles take place. 
You do all of these things. You see all the things he did, all the miracles. You walked with him. You saw him crucified. You remember all the things he told you about what was coming. You see it happen. Now you want to go home. Now, brothers and sisters, it took 12 people a short amount of time to turn the world upside down. Paul said, we have preached the gospel to every man under the sun. But Jesus, it wasn't time for him to come back. But they were waiting. Paul goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians, let no man deceive you. For the coming of the Lord will, and I'm paraphrasing, the, coming, the day of the coming of the Lord will not happen until the man of sin be revealed. So he looked at prophecy and realized, well, the man of sin hadn't even shown up yet. So let no man deceive you. Jesus is not coming back. Yes, we don't take the gospel to the whole world. But Jesus, unfortunately, is not coming back right now. Everything has to happen on time. Now, it says, but like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. Through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt and had declared that the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. Do you get that? That God said they were going to go in captivity in Egypt and it was going to last for how many years? 400 years. How long were they in Egypt? 400. To the day. And then they left. Afterward, he said, shall they come out with great substance? Did they come out with great yep. substance? Yes. yes. Against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled in vain. On the what? The self-same day, appointed in the divine promise, it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So in heaven's council, get this, so in heaven's council, the hour for the coming of Christ, what? It has already been determined. Now, brothers and sisters, we do not know the day or the hour, but we are admonished in the spirit of prophecy. We are required to know when it is near. Now, I'm, I'm way ahead of myself. I might catch up. I might go back. But let me ask you a question. <laughs> in, in, in time, where are we? Don't answer me. Are we in Egypt? Are we on the banks of the Jordan? Or are we in Canaan? So the Jordan. 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 Now, y'all didn't have to tell you, you, you know that. We're on the, the banks of the Jordan. Okay. Now, well then, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Romans 13. So you told me 
that I understand the time. I know the night is far spent. You told me that you recognize that we need to cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now the question is, how much work are we putting in with Christ to put on the whole armor of Christ, the whole armor of light? Brothers and sisters, I, I, want you to, I want this to sink into your heart. To be, in order to be safe to say, we have to fully reflect the character of Christ. Fully. In order to be safe to say, because when Christ comes, we will be changed from mortal to immortal. But that's it. Who you become in this preparation time is who you're going to be when Christ actually comes. So in order to be safe to say, what I mean by that is God is assured based on your choices and lifestyle that you would not get to heaven and start another rebellion. That's right. So we've got to be fully surrendered. So you just said, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. What is chambering? Sexual immorality. And wantonness, what's that? Lust. Lust. Causing other people to lust. How many of us realize, well, I, 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 I'll put it like this, I don't want to put anybody in the spot. What's with this new fashion? Mm. Where well, everybody wants to dress up like they're working out. What is the deal with that? Wow. Everybody wants to act like they work, they're, 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 they're working out. Now, here's what I find. That everybody seems to be doing it. And I, of course, not every single person on the planet, but the majority of people seem to be doing it. Right. But everybody, in their minds, are not trying to do what these fashions suggest they're trying to do. Come on. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they may, they may be dressing that way. Back when we were young, you, you know, some guy would see some girl, she might be dressed a certain way, and he's thinking, whatever. He walks up to her and starts talking to find out that's not where her mind was for real at all. She was just dressed that way. So I look around the world and I'm like, surely everybody's not thinking what well, I'm trying to do, whatever. But everybody's being deceived. Satan says, I want the whole world to follow me. But now being deceived means you, you just took the pill. You didn't understand what was going on. So he have you out here and wantonness causing a problem that you may not be trying to accomplish. Mm. Brothers and sisters, we've got to be conscious with God. Asking him to lead and to guide. I remember when I first started speaking, my dad would say, you know, son, I know you have suits. You always dress in a suit on Saturday. Um, I need you to speak at this event with me. Make sure you bring your preacher suit. He said, son, all them buttons, all that, all that stuff that's getting everybody's attention, not in God's pulpit. Huh. And so what the Lord was saying, it told me over the years, listen, if I'm going to speak through you, you can't be getting all the attention. I need you to pay attention. There's a certain way a man of God is supposed to walk and talk and act and dress. You need to get in that mold if I'm going to use you at all. Brothers and sisters, we all need to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm up here tonight, but I'm no better than any of us. Look, we all have a message to preach and teach. That's right. Wherever we are. You know, if you, if you are the nicest Christian, but you don't win a soul, will you be in the kingdom? There will be no starless crowns in the kingdom. Amen. We all have a message to preach and teach to somebody somewhere. We need to be seeking God's face on how to present ourselves, not be dependent on the world. Everything, do you understand that everything the world offers, most likely we have to disconnect from? Mm. Yeah. 
We're going to read tonight about what God says about when he gives his people the word, what the world thinks of them. The world doesn't like us when God's word resides fully in our hearts. All right, let's move on. Everything is based on time. We've been talking about this. When the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We find that in Desire of Ages. Now, as the message of Christ's first advent announced the kingdom of his grace, so the message of his second advent announces the kingdom of his glory. And the second message, like the first, is based on the prophecies. Now, this is an analogy that if you've listened to my father, you've seen this slide, maybe. Amen. But we are at the two-minute warning. That's right. And for those who have understood the, the game of football, you understand that the game is 60 minutes long, and at 58 minutes, there's a timeout. They send a message, to, there's two minutes. If you're down, we need to try to catch up. If we're ahead, we need to hold on to where we are. We need to stop them from catching up. So at the two-minute warning, at two minutes, there is a warning given. Now, we are living in the two-minute warning of Bible prophecy. This is where we are. So I want you to understand, I want to set the stage. We are this close to the very end. No timeouts left. Neither. No timeouts. This is it. The last two minutes. Now, in football, when they do this, they put a special team on the field to try to catch up. They put their best defenders to try to hold the other team from doing something. So at two minutes, if the game is really close, it can, it can go either way. Now, if we're at the two-minute warning of Bible prophecy, based on the analogy, what is Christ getting ready to do? He's going to be, bring a special team. Now, who, what has to happen for us to be on that special team? That's a loaded question, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody went right to it. We got to be sealed. Now, the question is, why do we need to be sealed? First of all, do we, under, do we understand what being sealed means? Have no sin in us. Practice no sin. Father, it's the heaven of the Lord. He's settling into the truth. Settling into the truth. God's character Amen. is fastened right here. We have gotten the victory over sin because Christ is living in us. Amen. We can stand the test of the trials that are coming. We are ready for the crisis because... We've been sealed. Now, 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 now. We are currently living in the two-minute warning. And Christ is waiting to select those who he can put on the field at the end of time. I want you to let that sink in. He is ready to select those who will be on the special team during the last two minutes. Now the water boy does not get called. <laughs> those that are on the sideline cheering don't get called. Only those who are prepared and practiced and are ready to execute what needs to happen at the last two minutes get on the field. Now the question is, will you and I be selected to get on the field in the last two minutes? That's the question of the day. That's why he always talked about it. That's why we're still talking. So just being a Seventh-day Adventist will not put me on the field. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Knowing the prophecies will not put me on the Amen. field. Being up front does not cause me to be put on the field. I've got to be sealed by God. I've got to be safe to save already. Because whoever gets on this field is going to do a final work and to be sealed. Now I won't. I, no, no, I won't. I won't. I 
don't even, I won't even say it. But we have to be sealed and be ready to be chosen to be on the field. Now, 58 minutes. We're down near the end zone. I want you to get this. We're down near the end zone. Let's call that the 10 yard line. We're almost ready to try to score a touchdown. Well, actually, it's in the reverse. We're, this is our end zone up here. We're all the way down there. But we got two minutes. We need one touchdown. We got to get in the end zone. We cannot get on the end. We can't get on the line. We got to get in the end zone. Two minutes. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 24. I gotta pick up the pace here a little bit. Matthew 24. Let's read verses, let's start at verse 8. It says, all these things, well, let's, let's, let's start with verse 6. So then you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you now be troubled. For all of these things must what? But the end, of course, is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, brothers and sisters, between verse 8 and 9, between verse 8 and 9 is the two minutes. Because you realize that everything we read before suggested that that was the beginning of sorrows. Right? But now verse 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So something happens between verse 8 and 9 that changes everything. So because we've been seeing the beginning of sorrows for a long time. Wars. Amen. We're probably going to go to war soon. Wars and rumors of wars, pestilences, all this has been happening. Amen. The beginning of sorrows. But verse 9 suggests that something has happened. What does it say in verse 10? And then shall many be what? Offended. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now, what does that sound like to you? Betrayal? Ah. Sounds like the shaking. Sounds like the shaking. Sounds like betrayal. <laughs> Something has happened and people are offended. So now think about what would make the world be offended by God's people. Make sure I got this right before I tell you the time. Their sins are being confronted. Their sins are being. Or their 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 sins are being um, uncovered. Mm. Okay. The loud cry. Lord, help me to find this text. And they would want a lie rather than the truth. <laughs> I'm going to find this text. This was not in my head. Uh, it'll come to me in just a moment. But the world is going to be offended in these two minutes because of the Sunday law. We're going to prove that. I'm not going to just make that statement. I'm going to bring that to you. Okay? 
They're offended because they passed a Sunday law and we've refused to keep it. Mm -hmm. And now they're offended. So they've lost their temporal prosperity and now they want, they're offended because we won't follow. So what we are finding, what we are reading here, and I'm going to bring this to you. So just, 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 just bear with me. What we, what we are reading is the beginning of sorrows and then the world is offended by you. So what we're reading in verse 9 is the time of trouble for God's people. That's, that's what happens there. So brothers and sisters, if the world is going to be offended, I have a slide here and I don't think I have it close, where it shows us who we're going to be hated because of, or by, I mean, imagine, nobody in the planet Earth has been hated by everybody. Nobody. We've been hated by some. Some people have been hated by others. But nobody's been hated by everybody. We're going to be hated by 196 countries. That's everybody on the planet. Why? Because of the Sabbath. Now. Now. I'm going to come back to that. I want us to read this right here. From the Jewish age down to the present time, Satan's warfare has been directed against the Son of God and his work. And he still flatters himself that he will obtain the victory. Now, let me ask you a question. How does Satan, how could he possibly, after the cross, still flatter himself that he can obtain the victory? Deception. Because of his deception, because of his lies. But now, don't we always say that Jesus died on the cross? That it's basically over until he comes back, like we know that Satan's going to lose? Isn't that, what, isn't that what we say? So then how can, how can Satan still flatter himself that he will obtain the victory? Maybe that's just because of who he is. Through God's people. Mm -hmm. Because he's ultimate evil, I guess. Well, he thinks he's going to cause all of God's people to sin. Ah. Yeah, he made he more of a remnant of, of his seed. He did so he, so he's, he's flattering himself that he can still win this thing because if you look at the state of God's people, yeah. he said, look, I, I've been pretty good at what I've been doing. And if I can cut off the sanctuary, if I can cause them to be blind, if I can cause them to be deceived, I can still win. I could not beat Christ at the cross. I tried. When Christ was born, he tried to kill him. He tried to cause him to, upon, when he took him up on the high mountain when he was uh, fasting, he tried to cause him to sin, then he didn't do it. He tried to kill him all throughout his ministry, and it didn't happen. Jesus died on the cross without committing sin. And as it says in Revelation, he knew then he had but a short time based on the fact that I lost at the cross. Now, Patriots, now, Story of Redemption brings out that when Satan was in the crowd of the people saying, crucify him, crucify him, it was not so much about him actually losing his life. He needed Christ to respond the wrong way. He needed him to get upset and call down legions of angels. He needed him to do something so he could win. Yeah. And he did not do it. So when Christ died on the cross without sinning, he knew based on Revelation 12, 10, Lamb without blemish. He didn't sin. He did it. Y'all, we got a short time left. We've got to hurry. That's why the Bible says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth for he has come down with great wrath because he knew he had a short time but in 1886 in 1886 
she was shown that he still flatters himself. It's 2018. Now tell me how much difference has taken place since 1886. And then tell me why he still flatters himself. Ooh. You understand who we're dealing with? He is not here to lose, y'all. Satan is playing to win. And he, if he can deceive us into thinking we're better than who we are, that we are almost there, that I'm, and I'm, I'm in a safe condition when I'm not, he's still winning. If he could, if God could not have a team to put on the field in the last two minutes of the game, say, say, I said, I told you you couldn't do it. I told you you couldn't do it, and because you couldn't do it, you got to let me back. I want to come back. And I want to take my form of rebellion to the rest of the whole universe. Brothers and sisters, God said that there will be a group of people that will be ready to be put on the field within the last two minutes. And I want to be one of many. One of a few. Revelation 12, 17. 12, 17, yes. It said... Uh, the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those that keep God's command and hold fast their testimony to Jesus. Till the end. Till the end. Till the end. Brothers and sisters, we don't have long. If he still flatters himself, then he can obtain the victory. Now we're talking about somebody who was a former covering chair. We're not talking about somebody walking down the street on earth. We're talking about somebody who was in heaven. He knows what we're trying to get to. He's been there. And he, don't make no mistake about it, he hates Jesus and anybody who's trying to be like him. And Patriots and Prophecy talks about when, when, when the angels saw, when Abraham was told to take the life of his son, the angel saw in that moment the love of Christ for us. What Abraham was going to do in worshiping God. Now, brothers and sisters, God said we can be ready to be on the field, but we are going to have to be prepared. Now, we know that there was war in heaven. It was a, a battle of epic proportions. Now, Lucifer is a was the light bearer. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 14. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So I put this in here to show. These are all his different names. Lucifer was, he was the light bearer in heaven. But when he came down here, he became an adversary. He was acting, he acted like he was a serpent, he used him to deceive. The, devil, the Bible calls him the devil, that's a tempter. And a dragon, he's going to prosecute. Once again, 
All these things he has done. When you look through the ages of time, when you look through time and see what he has done. When Christ died on the cross, he went to violence. He took the lives of many Christians. That did not work. He changed his tactics, and you know, we see that in the French Revolution. He changed his tactics on the Bible to cause people to turn from that to evolution and to believe that there was no God. But it was the same attack. He did all of these things. And he has caused God's people everywhere to turn from him. Even in God's church. I never would have thought that I would be privy to see the types of things that are actually happening in God's church. Amen. And when I say privy, I mean I've been up close and personal. Actually, me and my wife have both been up close and personal and watched a Seventh-day Adventist minister who we were close friends with walk away from the church. Just walk away. He was tempted. He was deceived. You would not believe the things that would come out of his mouth. But he literally walked away from the truth, walked away from the, the church, and then started his own church worshiping on the first day of the week. And that is happening over and over and over again. And, and, and the worship is so outlandish, it's so out yonder, that there's no way the truth could even be heard if it was preached. Then when the truth is trying to be preached, it is squandered and put away. All of these things that are taking place on a high level, on a low level. We were, I was talking to somebody uh, uh, in the back before we got started this evening about some of the things that are going on in the church. Leaders taking kids on skinny dipping, adventures, and all kinds of things going on in God's house. In God's house, at the end of time, take this in, in your mind. On the banks of the Jordan, we know what happened, right? Mm -hmm. We know what happened in the apostasy at the Jordan. So imagine here, we're on the banks of the Jordan. And right now, at the last two minutes of the game, we're getting ready, we should be getting ready to cross the Jordan. And right now, Satan is causing all of these things to take place in God's church. Yeah. Right as we're getting ready to cross the Jordan. The same thing he did to the, to the Israelites, mm -hmm. he is doing it again. Yeah. He sent the Midianites women into the camp, yeah. caused the fall to take place on it of an epic proportion. Long before Moses and them could be brought, brought to their attention, while they were, they were trying to map out a plan to get across the Jordan and take Jericho. But while that happened, while there was no action, while there was nothing happening, the Midianite women stole into the camp and became friends. This is why we're told not to become friends. We can be friendly, but we're not to become friends to the point where we begin to hang out and be like them and act like them. But it goes on to say in Patriots and Prophets that after a while, because of their friendliness, they began to hang out. And then they went to their festivities. And before you knew it, so many people, because of wine and because of their mind, so many had bowed down to the idols of, uh, of the enemy that the apostasy became national. Now here we are on the banks of the Jordan again. Jesus is getting ready to part the water for his people to walk across and take Jericho and go on into Canaan and yet we are worshiping how we're worshiping. We're dressing like we're dressing. We're still adoring ourselves like the world. We're still talking like the world. We are having block parties on Sabbath. On Sabbath. And serving everything that they eat so that they can come and be with us. I was in a tent crusade. Everything seemed to be going fine right up until we got ready to get started. And the pastor calls a meeting with his elders and says, well, the Lord has shown me that I should not preach doctrine. I said, what? What do you mean? 
And unfortunately, everybody on that call agreed. They thought it was a grand idea. There was only one on the call that said, mm, that's not a good idea. Now, I give that analogy because the pastor thought the Lord had told him that, but it was not the Lord. Right. And all of his elders agreed. That's the leadership of that church. Right. Now, what do you think is happening in that church? He left. The same pastor, he left the church and the church, I don't know what to do. I don't know what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But this is what's happening in God's church. That's why at two minutes, he still flatters himself that he can still win. Now, if we want to be on the field, if we want to be selected to be on the field, Brothers and sisters, we've got to go through the process of being prepared to be sealed. A lot of this, some of this we're going to talk about tomorrow. This is what brought us on the scene. The three angels' message. It says the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message. Embracing the messages of the first and second angels. All should understand the truths contained in these messages and demonstrate them in daily life. For this is essential to salvation. We shall have to study what? Prayerfully. Prayerfully. In order to understand these grand truths and our power to learn and comprehend will be what? Yes. To the utmost. That's the first angel. We're talking about the third angel's message. We know this is found in Revelation 14. Now, what is the deal with this fourth angel? Who is that angel? The gospel. Huh? First angel. The, this fourth angel. The fourth angel. I'm sorry. The, the fourth angel. What is the deal with the fourth angel? Well, all right. Uh, it's the loud cry. That angel is super important. All of them are important. But this fourth angel is super important. Why do you think it is so important to us? Because he's trying to let people know that Jesus is, is here and real. I mean, he's the real deal. And this is it. Mm, this is it. Now, I'm going to put something out there that I will... And maybe we're the two men mark. Mm. Now I'm going to put this out there. We'll prove it tomorrow. The fourth angel, let's just let's read. I heard somebody say it's in Revelation 18. 18. Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Start with verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having what? Great power. Great power. And the earth was what? Light. So this angel is flying. This, this angel is moving. He's got great power. And he cried what? With a strong voice saying what? Battle. Is fallen, is fallen, and, and is what? of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying what? Come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now, the message that the fourth angel is saying is, come out of her, my people, that you be not what? Partakers of her sins. Now, this fourth angel, this is a message 
coming from God with even more force. Okay? But now, this message will be carried with this great force by who? Us. <laughs> so this fourth angel is talking about something that we're going to be doing under the power of the Holy Spirit. We call this the latter rain. The loud cry. This is what's going to happen to that. This is who, this is what helps select that team who's going to be on the field during the last two minutes of the game. The question is, this, this is what we're going to be going to be talking about this tomorrow. Who gets the latter end? Who will receive it? I heard God's people. What do you think? Those who receive the, the, the early rain. Only those who are sold into the truth spiritually and intellectually. So, if you can you receive the latter rain if you never received the spirit of Pentecost? No. I asked it that way on purpose. No. Huh? No. 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 If you've never had the first experience, if you've never gone there and understood what was going on and went through that process, what do I mean by that? Accepted the Lord and began to follow Him. Mm. Pentecostal power should be happening right now. Amen. It wasn't just for the disciples, it was for everyone. If you read God's Word over in Acts and Romans and Corinthians, many things happen amongst God's people, not just the apostles. Pentecostal power should be, is available right now. So, in order to receive the latter rain, you've got to have the experience of the early rain. Amen. And then you've got to go through that process in the most holy place with Christ so that he can change who you are. And then you can be sealed. We're going to talk about tomorrow living in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Mm. That is going to happen to God's people. Now how, we'll probably get it right here. Listen, let's walk through the sanctuary. We don't have time to go to Leviticus and walk through it, but what was the most important day in the sanctuary service for the Israelites? The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. Yes. Now what happened on the Day of Atonement? The sanctuary was cleansed. Cleansing, I want to hear that word. Cleansing took place on that day. Now, every other day of the week or the year, you come to the altar or to the to, to, to give forgiveness and you bring your sacrifice, you give it to who? The priest. the priest. You kill it and you go through the ceremony and then he takes the blood and he puts some of it on the curtain and your sins were embodied in, 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 in that symbol on the curtain until when? The day, the day of atonement. Now, they did this all year long. Until the Day of Atonement. Then the day they had to prepare for the Day of Atonement. Now on the Day of Atonement, when the priest was officiating in the sanctuary, if you sinned on that day, and you brought your lamb to get forgiveness, you would walk up and find no priest. So then you couldn't have forgiveness that day, now could you? That day, in time, they had to stand before a holy God without a mediator. Mm. That's why they had to prepare and get the victory over sin. That's cool. Yeah. And we can never read in the Bible where anybody had to be led out with the goat. Mm. Wow. So all I know is that on that day, People had the victory. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible, I believe the Bible would have spoken if somebody messed up. And they had to be led out when the strong man took the goat out, when, they, when the, after the priest had laid his hands on his head. I believe the Bible would have spoken. No mention. So on that day, everybody in the camp had victory. 
But they had to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator that day. And if we're walking in the antitype, we're going to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. That's why our lives must become habitual right now in living for Christ, in victory. Amen. That's why the preparation time is so important right now. That's why we can't play any more games, brothers and sisters. We have to gain the victory with Christ's help today. Amen. One of the things that the Lord showed me early on after my father passed, it did not, it did not take long. Marcus, what you thought you were, who you thought you were, what you thought you knew, you do not know, and you are not that person. Now, I'm going to give you some grace and allow you to see it because I've given you a job. But what you got to do is get in this word and stop playing games. You were standing in your father's shadow. You have got to get on your knees and have a real relationship with me and you better do it quick. Because I've asked you to stand up and so you have got to do it. Brothers and sisters, it is no different for you. God has asked you to stand up and you've got to do it. I've got to do it. And ever since then, I have I've been like a baby. Because the person I used to call to ask questions, I can't call them no more. I got to get the answers myself. I got to agonize with God until he gives it to me. I've got to help. I've got to pray that he breaks it down to me and gives me understanding of this thing. Every time I had a question, I would call my dad. What do you think about this? And he would tell me. Only every now and then he would say, son, go study. And if you still ain't get it in a few days, call me back. But for the most part, he would just say, well, turn over to such and such. And now I don't have that. Now I've got to stand on my own two feet. And as I said at the funeral, I've got to swing with my own back. That's been an eye-opening experience. Brothers and sisters, we've got to do the same thing. We've got to stand on our own two feet. We have got to be prepared to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. That means to do that, we have got to be like Job, where God trusts us enough to say, have you considered my servant Marcus? Who avoids you? He has gotten to the point, he avoids you. He doesn't like anything you do anymore. Mm. Try pushing all of his buttons. They're all disconnected. Wow, man. Try. I'm going to get ready to come back, and I'm going to step back. Have at it. He will not fall. They will not fall. This is where we have to get to, brothers and sisters. We have got to get into the most holy place with Christ. This experience we must have. We need to behold Christ's glory. We need to surrender until we are fully into who he would have us to be. Amen. If we're not there, brothers and sisters, we need to get in the sanctuary. We need to know where Christ is. We need to understand the nearness of the hour. The stuff we see happening around the world we have never, ever seen anything like this. When you watch what happens in the government from day to day, and not, I'm talking about the absolute nonsense of everything you see. I don't care who it is. This world is in a state of absolute chaos. And men are fearful, as it says in Luke 21, they are fearful what's coming on the earth. There is not an answer. We are being lied to daily by whoever the politician may be. The world is nervous. Nobody knows what's going to happen. You think we're going to get bombed one day, or we're going to bomb somebody else. The stuff going on, y'all, is a sign that the end is upon us. The wagons are being circled. We, God's people, God's church, 
have made major missteps in linking arms with the dragon. Amen. It has happened. It is unfortunate, but it is a sign that when you see that, know that redemption draweth not. And we don't have time to still just see it and talk about it. But it should tell us, get on your knees. Get yourself together with me so that I can start to live habitually through you. Because you know if it becomes a habit, when something becomes a habit, when something happens to trigger that habit, it just, it just happens. It's just natural. You don't even have to think about it. That's how they teach them in the military. You know, in war, you don't think about it. You, 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 you with your other person in war, you don't have to think about it. We've practiced this, we've done this so long, when things happen, we know who gets out of the plane first. We know what happens when you got my situation. We know what to do. Police officers the same way. They, they do it so much that it becomes a habit. Amen. You don't think about it. Amen. Because we want to make it home. Yeah. That's what they say. Our life with Christ must become a habit. So that when he steps back, we're just living habitually. So when Satan comes and does that thing, we just respond out of habit. The button is dead. I don't respond anymore. Amen. That's what we got to have. So that when Christ comes, we're all going to see him. But we can all see him in peace, brothers and sisters. Amen. In peace. We're going to talk about more of this tomorrow by standing in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Be, being prepared. Victory over sin. Who gets the latter rain? What is it going to take to get the latter rain? Because that's where we are. Everything else has happened. We're getting, the stage is being prepared for God's people to be tested. Who's going to pass that test? We're going to talk about the ten virgins tomorrow. Brothers and sisters, that ten virgin parable is so serious. Amen. Yes. Yes. And I'll, I'll tell you this. Those who don't like the truth, who don't want to hear the truth, who don't want to be bothered with the truth, are not even mentioned in that parable. Mm. That's right. You get that? Yeah, that's right. Amen. 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 Those who don't even want to hear the truth aren't even mentioned in the ten virgin parable. It's not even talking about them. Everything in the Ten Virgin Parable are talking about those who actually like the truth. Amen. And there were still five That's foolish. Right. And Peter says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where will the ungodly appear? Where will the ungodly? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, what we're talking about, what we're dealing with, what we're facing before we are dealing with, this is no plaything. The only way we're going to survive is with Christ's help. Man. That's it. Man. That's it. We've got to link up with him. We've got to link up with him and we've got to move. It's one thing I've learned. I keep saying I'm on him with this. It's one thing I've learned. Since my dad passed away. Is when God says do something, you just get a move on. He tells you to give up something, get a move on. He tells you to get rid of something, get a move on. He tells you to leave something alone, get a move on, get away from it. If you hesitate, doubt sets in. That's right. But if you move, God is there to help you move right away. If God says do it, do it. I'm standing here before you only because with Christ's help, he said to do something. I did it. I'm still walking that journey. Amen. But I want to be ready when Christ comes. How about you? Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, oh Lord, we have come this evening. Lord, you've said things to us. Lord, we want to be prepared to see you in peace, plain and simple. Lord, we need your help in getting prepared. Help us to surrender our hearts to you. Amen. So that you can, can form a habit of living for you in our lives. So we can be a light around those when we're around our friends and family, but we can be a light. 
And then when Satan comes to push those buttons, oh, we do not respond in any way. Lord, that's what we need to be. But you are here to help us get there. Help us to be faithful, Lord. Protect us and keep us as we leave here. For any time God's people get together and fellowship with you, he's never had. Bring us back tomorrow, Lord, at the appointed hour. Amen. So that you can speak to our hearts again those things we need to hear. Help us to be prepared, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.